Hi everyone, welcome to our series on statistics. This is episode one and we'll be diving into univariate data analysis. Now, what does univariate data analysis even mean? Let's try to break it down. Uni is Latin for one. Variate means variable, so univariate just means a quantity that can be measured by one characteristic. For example, a person's favorite ice cream flavor is univariate. Data relates to raw information, so univariate data is just a heap of information that contains one measurable characteristic. For example, a survey of 1,000 people's favorite ice cream flavors will contain raw data about one characteristic about a person. Note that in our next episode, we'll be covering bivariate data analysis, which contains two characteristics for each data point. So essentially, univariate data analysis is analyzing data that contains one characteristic and drawing useful conclusions from them. Going back to the same example, the survey of people's favorite ice cream flavor is merely just a bunch of words and numbers by itself. We want to deduce and make adequate conclusions about the data. For example, selling more strawberry ice cream because it was the most popular from the data and obviously it's the best flavor. So in this episode, other than the standard bar charts, column charts, pie charts we learned when we were younger, we will be discussing the three specific types of univariate data charts. Number one, frequency, histograms and polygons. Number two, Pareto charts. And number three, box and whisker plots. In order for us to draw a histogram and polygon, we first need to construct a frequency table. The definition of frequency is the number of times the outcome occurs in an experiment. For example, say we survey 100 students about their HSC exam marks. Then we just tally up and enter the frequencies of each outcome into a table. But as you can see, this frequency table is way too complicated, which can be tedious to construct and difficult to interpret. So what you can do when you observe such a wide range of outcomes is to group these outcomes into bins or classes to best observe the trends in the data. To create appropriate classes, one, choose a nice rounded number below your smallest outcome and above your highest outcome. Multiples of 10 always work well. So in our example, we choose 30 and 100. Two, try to divide that range into five to 15 equally sized bins. So in our example, we would have seven classes, each with size 10, where all the scores from 31 to 40 are in the first bin, scores from 41 to 50 are in the second bin, so on until all the scores from 91 to 100 are in the seventh and last bin. Now, if we construct a new bin frequency table, it is much easier to digest and analyze. We can also calculate the cumulative frequency, which refers to the sum of frequencies from the first to the current outcome. It's pretty much a running total of frequencies from the start. Another way to find the cumulative frequency is to add the previous cumulative frequency and the current frequency together. We can also add the relative frequency column, which is the proportion of the current frequency out of the total frequency. Note, this is very similar to what a probability means. So we will be using relative frequencies a lot when we construct our probability distribution functions in episode three. Once we have all the data summarized into a good looking frequency table like this, we can now construct a frequency histogram and polygon, which are essentially bar and line charts, but using numerical data rather than categorical. So unlike bar and line charts, histograms and polygons are labeled and drawn slightly differently. So let's go through some of the differences. Firstly, each consecutive tick mark on the x-axis does not represent a continuous scale, but rather each tick mark represents a successive outcome or class. So in our example, we label each tick mark with the class range or the class center. Secondly, there are no gaps between each column of the histogram. This is because the histogram represents numerical data and the area under the histogram actually means something. Finally, the polygon starts at the x-axis, joins each of the midpoints of the columns, and then ends back at the x-axis. So this is what a histogram and a polygon looks like. Although there will be slightly different versions, always follow what your teacher or your school advises first. To draw a cumulative frequency histogram or polygon, it is the exact same process but using cumulative frequencies instead. The only difference is that the cumulative polygon, aka the ogive, starts at the bottom left corner of the first column, joins each of the top right corners, and then ends at the top right corner of the last column. If histograms and polygons are used to represent numerical data, we can use Pareto charts to represent categorical data. So let's go back to the same favorite ice cream flavor example. Here is our frequency table from our survey. 
A Pareto chart is simply a bar chart that reorders the frequencies or columns in descending order and then adds a cumulative frequency line chart on top of it. So we first reorder the frequency table so it's decreasing in frequency. Then we draw this reordered bar chart. Finally, we draw the cumulative frequency line chart. Note it's not the standard frequency. Now, why the heck do we even do this? Well, the Pareto chart is actually based on the Pareto principle, commonly known as the 80-20 rule. It was coined after Wilfred Pareto, an Italian economist who observed that 20% of Italians owned 80% of the land in Italy. The Pareto principle then became this general idea that approximately 20% of observations account for 80% of the outcome. Very common examples of Pareto principles include 20% of customers generate 80% of the business's sales, 20% of companies cause 80% of the world's pollution, and 20% of drivers cause 80% of all traffic accidents. Box and whisker plots tell us more about the spread and distribution of numerical univariate data. We can break down drawing the box and whisker plot into four easy steps. One, order the data smallest to largest. Two, find the data point in the middle position, also known as your median. Note, if there is an even amount of data, then we take the average of the two data points in the middle. Three, find the data point in the middle position of the first half and the second half. This is known as your first and third quartiles. Note, when you're looking for the quartiles, exclude the median in your calculation. Finally, draw a vertical line at the median, a box around your first and third quartile, and then whiskers to your smallest and highest data point. Now a parallel box plot, as fancy as it sounds, is just two box and whisker plots stacked on top of each other to compare the underlying distributions. For example, say we conducted two surveys of 100 people in Australia and 100 people in Austria. We can compare the results easily by plotting a parallel box plot to see how different the middle position or the median is, to see how different the middle 50% or the interquartile range is, or to see how large the outliers or the whiskers are. So that's it for episode one. Tune in for the next episode on bivariate data or click here on episode zero to watch the big picture on statistics. So please like, subscribe and leave a comment below on what you would like to see next. And I'll be there. I'll be there. Bye.